Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at theCUBE Research. And I am joined today by my fellow analyst, engineer, member of the CUBE community, collective of independent analysts, Joe Peterson. Joe, welcome. It's great to see you. Hey, Shelly. And we are joined today uh, for a conversation on all things supply chain and supply chain security by Cassie Crossley, who's the VP of Supply Chain Security, Cybersecurity, and Product Security at Schneider Electric. Welcome, Cassie. It's great to have you as well. Thank you for having me, Shelley and Joe. Well, we have been looking forward to this conversation for a while for a variety of reasons. And before we dive into all things, some of the insights I know you're going to share with us, I want to talk a little bit about Schneider Electric. Um, many people don't know Schneider is a French multinational company um, specializing in digital transformation and energy management, combines energy, tech, software, real-time automation, and services designed to transform homes, buildings, data centers, infrastructure, and industries. Um, earlier this year, the company actually launched its new industrial digital transformation services, which are designed to help in industrial enterprises achieve future-ready innovative, sustainable, effective, and end-to-end -end digital transformation. Well, that's kind of a mouthful. But it's safe to say that supply chain and the security of supply chain play a huge role in digital transformation initiatives. And I know that no one here is going to disagree with me on that. So as we talk, so we move from digital transformation to supply chain security. And, you know, as is the case with security breaches in general, according to the State of State of Supply Chain Defense Annual Global Insights Report 2023, oh, that's a mouthful, which was published by supply chain threat monitoring company Blue Voyant, the average number of supply chain breaches increased by 26% from 2022 to 2023. And the mean number of supply chain breaches increased from 4.16 incidents in 23. No, it increased to 4.16 incidents in 23 from 3.29. That doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, when you look at a 26% increase overall, that's kind of a lot. So one of the things that was really interesting to me and, and some insights I know we'll get from you, Cassie, is that, you know, the, the Blue Voyant report shared that by and large, companies are just not equipped to understand the extent and the nature of the threat to businesses that are posed by third party vendors. And, and you know, and the real challenge is getting supply chain vendors to consistently address risk quickly after they're made aware of a vulnerability or a supply chain issue, a security issue. Um, and again, this comes from this report by Blue Voyant. But I think that to me, the good news in the data here is that while supply chain breaches have increased, so have budgets. And 85% of the Blue Voyant survey respondents indicated they have increased their budget for supply chain and third-party security over the course of the last 12 months. So I see that as a positive. Now we're going to turn to you, Cassie, with your deep expertise in supply chain security. Of course, we're thrilled to have you. Um, before we get started with some technical questions, would you share a little bit about kind of your career backstory and, and walk us along the journey that you've taken to end up where you are? Sure, sure. Well, I have to say, and I, I'm using the term somebody else uh, said once before I heard, I'm a failed programmer. Uh, I started out as a developer, uh, and in those days, I was just called a programmer, uh, which requires you to sit still and actually focus on your screen and, and things like that for 8 to 12 hours a day. And I'm a bit of an extrovert, and I like to move around and talk. Uh, there wasn't really project managers back in, those, in that yeah. time frame. So I actually moved uh, from doing... Uh, software development into technical support for a, a application product. It used to be called uh, Lotus and Me Pro. It was a competitor to Microsoft Word, obviously Microsoft Word One. And then uh, I went and started writing uh, for Lotus communication manuals and eventually led uh, documentation teams for McAfee and other companies around. And so I was in the communication field, but 
uh, I wanted also not to sit down and write. So it's sort of similar. You have to just sit there and, and not uh, talk all day long, although talking with the developers and writing down those things was always interesting. So I actually moved into project management, which was the home that I was looking for by that time. And I got to lead technology teams. So I've led and been involved with thousands of software releases, both on the end consumer side, so shrink wrap product software uh, for clients, but also internal releases. So I would go between end user and internal end user kind of products and led those. I've led IT projects. I led an, a huge multi-million dollar ERP upgrade. So I've been in technology, but also on the business side, working with customers, solution sales. I ran a professional services team for Ceridian, which is an HR payroll company. So I've got all these different kinds of backgrounds that I did. And with Schneider, when I came to Schneider almost 14 years ago, I led a program management office for our video line of business. I did that, you know, the ERP and our configure quote platform. And then they asked me to lead what's called our crown jewel program and the governance and policy in our CISO office. And I'm like, well, I worked at McAfee, you know, I know, I know some security. Um, of course, I can, do this. I, I can do this. Um, so I went and, and did that. So I was in the CISO side of the office for three, uh, three or so years. And I went to my, uh, the CISO and I said, you know, I would like to work with R and D again. And so I joined the product security office and I owned a lot of the pieces, the governance, the secure development life cycle. So I initiated our third party assessment process for product security piece. And I could talk about that because that was a big contributor to why I realized that the rest of the world doesn't have a mature secure development life cycle yes. and, and supplier practices. And then, uh, and then we merged the teams together last year. And that's when I focus specifically on supply chain security. So I'm still working with all of those, but now I have that end to end life cycle and that, you know, the book actually got started before that, but it really just shows, you know, all the pieces that we're doing. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to be an extremely mature company where we put such a focus on internal cybersecurity, but also product security. So right. I wanted to share that with the world and that this is the way that we're doing that. Well, you know what? That took a question that I was going to ask you off of the table because because you're talking about your book, Software Supply Chain Security, and that was just published recently, correct? Yes, yes in the okay. February, March timeframe. Great, great. And so that was really the impetus, all of the the story that you shared and being able to wrap that all up into a narrative was kind of the impetus behind writing the book. Is that right? Yes. Um, working with suppliers, we have over 54,000 suppliers for Schneider Electric. You know, a lot of those are just component suppliers, you know, screws, you know, things like that. Uh, but over 2,000 of those suppliers are intelligent suppliers. You know, they provide intelligent components, software components, mm -hmm. chips, things that they may be part of the manufacturing process. We develop a lot of operational technology and an IoT technology. So they have access to that firmware. And those suppliers need extra scrutiny, right? Yes. You know, you need to see what's going on in their uh, standpoint. So, you know, I kept providing... NIST documents and links here and links there and, you know, <laughs> looking at their maturity as we uh, look at, you know, are we going to use the supplier and even mature medium sized companies have been around a long time and we all use their products. We're not meeting the bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, that's really important that when you can't say, you know, just go read this because it's not just the NIST SSDF, the secure software development cycle. Mm -hmm. It's much more than that. It's the training aspect. It's, you know, how are you securing these environments? But then what happens in the distribution model? You know, what's, what's the platform like that you're doing it for, whether it be mobile apps or software over the air, all of that's really important. And it wasn't in one single place. And that's why, that's why I got tired of sending out all the links. So in the book alone, there's 200 references. Oh, wow. And my entire selection of things that I read through and and analyze for 400 i mean i've got i've got a ton of references because it was all spread out and i really wanted to be able to say i work with a lot of startups and i wanted to be able to say just read this 
look, I have 78 controls in here. So adapt what you want. But this is what's truly important. This is what I would look for in a supplier. It's like a guidebook. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. It's a practical okay. guide. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and you know, I mean, we've talked about this a lot before, but the risk that comes to an organization from third party vendors is significant, you know, and we've got dating back as far as the target breach, which I think was one of the first really gigantic data breaches that we were talking about, you know, that was a third party vendor. And that was right. an, an issue that arose from them. And it wasn't the solar winds breach also a third party vendor. And, you know, so there are there are very real risks associated here as it relates to, you know, the, and, and those vendors are super important in terms of the supply chain that we all work with, but really getting arms around that risk is a huge thing. <laughs> so, so speaking of third-party cyber risk management, do you feel like, are, do, do, do you feel like maybe we're reaching kind of a turning point or a heightened awareness point as it relates to how organizations are thinking about and focusing on third-party cyber risk? I, I think we are at a turning point. I know I present quite a lot and talk with CISOs all the time mm -hmm. uh, and stress in my book, you can't just look at ISO 27K or SOC 2. It doesn't cover software security practices. It doesn't. And so you need to learn what's not in your normal skill set to understand what to look for. So even if they're not building applications, they're not selling their own things that they're responsible, they are now and have been, you know, dependent on all of these others. I mean, who has a software bill of materials for Microsoft Teams? I haven't seen it, but you know, I'm sure Microsoft has a copy. Those are the kinds of things that I spend a lot of time talking to them about, you know, not only just trusting the, this is what you should be looking for uh, in your IT and just standard cybersecurity programs, but you need to be concerned about their AppSec programs and not that they're perfect. There's going to be vulnerabilities. There's going to be things that happen, but you know, is that company equipped to manage it? Do they have vulnerability management? Do they have all of this? And that's what's important is to really have that relationship with your critical suppliers and understand how they do business. And, and you know, it's, you know, I, as a product security officer, most companies don't have a product security officer, right? So right. who are you going to go to? You're going to go to the CISO. So that third-party risk management, which was very much a GRC and, and finance function, became a lot of cybersecurity, and they had that go-no-go. -go. But they haven't expanded yet to all the questions that will, you know, they're not going to stop the solo in. And nobody could have asked the right question that would have prevented that anyway. But mm -hmm. it's, what am I going to do when I think about it? I you know, I asked them, do you have the proper back to basics, DR, you know, disaster recovery and business continuity plans when this vendor goes out? When Kronos was down for six weeks for their platform, could you do the payroll by hand? You know, what are all those? You know, at any company, what your critical applications are by now. I mean, you should know. And <laughs> so what are you going to do? When that one, assume breach, what's going to happen? Assume, you know, assume this and go through all of those. It's, it doesn't take longer than a couple of days to workshop. What are we going to do in this case? Because mm -hmm. that is your cyber risk portfolio from a risk management standpoint that you need to be considering. And so that, that's what I, I really think that third party risk management, there's, a, there's people in the business that do that. But nobody knows it like the CIO and CISO. When you're running through, what would this mean if it was turned off for 20 minutes? I mean, that's you. It makes a big difference. I agree. That's a great answer. And, you know, one of the things that I, you, you talked about it a little bit earlier about the fact that you're in a very mature organization and that's that's kind of lucky, right? Not everybody sits in that sort of mature organization. Um, let's just say that I'm in a, I'm in a mediumly secure organization, immediately mature even, right. And I need to pitch the board for, for some more money because I really, you know, would like a strong supply chain. Um, talk to me 
as as if I were a board member and tell me why a strong supply chain matters to the company? Well, we did an exercise with our top cyber risks where we went through a third party. They evaluated our kill chain and determined based off of real conversations and situations what the estimated maximum loss is. So if we were impacted by that one, and it, it didn't truly require a third party, but what they did is they analyzed not only what it would meant internally, but also what it could be from a liability standpoint, mm-hmm. uh, because we work in the safety business, right? I mean, a lot of what we do is running critical infrastructure. So if this impacted, you know, a safety event or something like that, or, you know, what would be the, the chance of the business loss? And again, I don't think you have to do that from a third party. If you were talking specifically with your business leadership and yeah. really calculating, you know, from a, you know, if we don't upskill this, what is the potential loss that is happening? Your cyber insurance people are doing this at a company level. <laughs> if you take it to more of an application or an area level to say this, in fact, let's say the HR apps, you know, we need someone dedicated to focus on the cybersecurity of those HR applications and this kind of infrastructure. And it requires this and and some DLP or some, you know, uh, some data loss prevention pieces, you know, on the finance side. If you're talking about the loss, then you're speaking in business terms. So it's not about the return on investment. But it's more about that estimated maximum loss, which as cyber practitioners, we have that hidden in all of our, you know, let's just say in our CISM and CISSP training, but do we, do we really do it? I mean, that's what we're looking at. And that's, you know, it's not the cry wolf thing. It's like, I am prioritizing for this year. These are my largest gaps. Identity access management has always been one, right? It still lives with phishing and different kinds of things. It's like, if we lose the keys to the kingdom because somebody, you know, is infiltrated, let's just say you're a company and you want to buy tokens for somebody. So you're not running off of um, the SMS texting for multi-factor authentication. Then you can show those examples, but I would always do it with an estimated maximum loss. There's enough data out there to talk about others that have got breached and what the liability is. Now you've got the SEC filing if they're a U.S. company, mm-hmm. a U.S. company. And that's what, as a board, that we're talking about. We don't go to boards, our board and say, this is this is our current, you know, the current infrastructure and the dashboard for our Windows 11, blah, 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 security. We say, these are the risks that we're seeing that we've prioritized in order to be able to support the business and not, you know, you don't want it to be brought to its knees, right? You don't want the colonial pipeline. How much did that cost? And I mean, you know, there's all those estimates with solar winds and, you know, just the MGM one, right? The ransomware for MGM. All of those numbers are out there. Yeah. I mean, you, the United healthcare one, you know, those numbers keep climbing because of all the lawsuits and potential lawsuits. So we have the information, but that's where us as cyber folks have to think from a business standpoint or even an insurance, you know. Well, you, you have to speak the language of your stakeholders, you know. You do. Okay. Makes perfect okay. sense. Yeah, and you mentioned something and it made me think about it, the domino effect, right? You mentioned HR software going down. There's some states where if you don't make payroll, the state starts finding you the next yeah. day, Yeah. right? The yeah. next day they're finding you. So forget about all the people that are just, you know, working the help desk because they haven't gotten their paycheck, right? right. And, and all the load that that causes on the business and just that internal strife and stress, which I'd be upset if I didn't get my paycheck too, but the, in California, at least, you don't make payroll and the state starts finding you the next day. That's right. And you've got those same kind of fines with data privacy. You've got it with, you know, other things in the EU. Um, they're going to have the Cyber Resilience Act that we're working toward. If you don't have that compliance, you can't sell the product. So all of a sudden you go from, you know, being able to make, you know, this much money to, you know, this much because you don't have the right cybersecurity practices um, in place. 
Yeah. And can I tell you that I personally loved all the controls you had in your book. I was <laughs> excited. I was like a kid in a candy store, right? Because I love that you're teaching smaller firms how to do this, which is which is awesome. But if you could share one piece of advice for a smaller firm without a deep bench of expertise or resources that is just getting started on their supply chain security journey, what would it be? Um, I probably would, it depends on if they're doing their own development uh, first. Um, I think that overall, one of the things that I stress is that developers, we can do anything with our systems and no one's watching. Yeah. So I can create my own virtual machine. I can do this. I can do that and so on and so forth. And I'm going to pull down this project and build this one and so on and so forth. I don't want developers locked down so they, they can't do it. They need to be aware of what they're bringing in. So imagine you know, you, you're a developer and you just opened your door to everybody in the neighborhood, right? You know, and you don't know the neighbors at all and who you just invited in. That's what we're doing as developers because we've been able to do that forever, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is have our developers understand the risks. You know, you have to assume that each one of those projects and code that they're bringing down, whether it be open source, they include in what they're building, but even just in general, what they're using to build things, that it could have logic bombs, it could have backdoors, it has, can have malicious things hidden in. We just saw that with the XZ backdoor um, that um, happened where it had been, you know, this backdoor had been in the release for a while, it just hadn't been widely consumed. And we saw it with, you know, there's other vulnerabilities, but that one was intentionally set. I would say that is my chief thing that I say, if you've got a developer in house, you know, don't cut them off, but they need to understand about going through proper scanning and evaluation and peer reviews. So that's one. And then the other thing we've talked a bit about is third party supply chain is you really need to level up your suppliers to say, uh, you know, we expect this from cybersecurity. So I include ways um, in one of the chapters, if you're not getting responses, what you can do, what should be in your cyber agreements, uh, you know, and not asking for the impossible, but saying, tell me what your vulnerability plan is. What should I expect from you? If there's a security, where am I supposed to go? If you don't have time to inform your 10,000 customers and that communication and relationship with suppliers is very important. So those are the two main important things that I would see. Those are good ones. Thanks. Yeah. Those are great ones. You know, one of the things that I was looking at before the show was the Lehigh business supply chain risk management index. It was released here not long ago, the end of March. And it shows, not surprisingly, that cybersecurity risk is number one for the fifth straight quarter in terms of things that, uh, that you know, that CISOs worry about and CIOs worry about. And, and of course, and again, something that we talk about all the time, the fact that generative AI has become a major concern, not only across the organization as a whole as it relates to security, but certainly for supply chain managers. Um, I noticed that, and by the way, I think this is the most interesting name, Zach Zachariah, that's his name, uh, is an associate professor of supply chain management, and he's the director of the Center for Supply Chain Research at Lehigh, who did this report, um, said that thoughts about Gen AI and how that might increase an organization's vulnerability um, was identified by survey respondents as the second highest risk. Um, what are your thoughts on the risks that gener generative AI brings as it relates to supply chain? Well, I do believe that AI can definitely speed things up from a capability. So let's, let's take an example. Um, if you have somebody who wants to program, let's say something malicious, there are still ways, and now there are even uh, AI platforms specifically on the dark web that allow that that don't have the controls in place. So I think that the what what would have been harder for somebody to learn, especially in in our space where there's more proprietary languages and you know sort of different areas, that 
people can learn and get more quickly up to speed. So what we used to call script kitties, where they would know how to do, you know, JavaScript and, you know, all sorts of little quick things. Now that's speeding up. All right. So from there is a way, plus we've seen with phishing attempts, now they're much better. Uh, because they're self-correcting and, you know, it's like, show me, you know, provide what an email from Okta would look like. And so it'll go out and find one or some, you know, those kinds of things can be easily uh, found, whereas before it was a bit harder. Yeah. Um, however, you know, while that's going to increase and there's always going to be, unfortunately, productivity increases uh, and uh, quality increases uh, for, on the malicious side, what we're going to benefit from on the uh, on all of the different, if you're looking at the NIST, CSF, and you know, identify, detect, um, protect, uh, all of those, we're get, we're seeing an increase already. Um, I know that if you go to RSA, the you know the security conference, everybody's going to say I. It's really unlike it's less of a how should I say where we used to say oh yeah it's not really you know this. It's not hard to incorporate some LLM models from, you know, large language learning models and everything into products to be able to take the data and start to learn through it. We did that with machine learning, but it's gotten even quicker to be able to adapt that. So I think that the language and the behavioral intelligence where we're still going to have to help train, but just the level of alerting in your sim, your, you know, the it, event management tools in your logging tools will get better. Um, and so just overall, I think we're going to get faster to be able to help identify the nuances to look for that little, you know, needle in a haystack. It's going to help with that. And we're also seeing, um, a, you know, what I hope will be much better is from a vulnerability management. Like, tell me really what the risk is. Cause I've got dashboards that look at here's this, this has got a known exploit and it shows this and that, and I'm prioritizing it and there's pieces like that, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to see that pass through to the developers. Cause we have been pretty lacking, pretty poor and being able to say to the developer, if you do this and the, so using those um, co-pilots for good, not necessarily to generate new code, but to help with suggested improvements. I think that that's going to make a big difference over a line, uh, over time. So. Yeah, I think a lot of what I see here is that, you know, especially in the small to mid market, which are still some very, very big companies, right? Um, the beauty of embracing AI as it relates to supply chain and other things you know, other things that we want to accomplish for productivity and efficiency and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think that, and again, Joe and I talk about this all the time, but the the thing that's so important to understand if you're getting pushback about it, or if you can't find yourself getting excited about, you know, learning queries and that sort of thing, the reality of it is, as you mentioned, threat actors are out there leveraging this technology yep. right now. And they are using it to be faster and better. And, you know, we used to be able, sort of with our naked eye, uh, we used to be able to get a, a text message or an email, you know, phishing email. And we could tell, you know, just some mm -hmm. things were just slightly off. And a lot of that is, you know, non-English as a first language and speakers and that sort of thing. But now, you know, threat actors are using AI and they're very much incentivized to do it because the better they get at it and the quicker they do it, the more money they stand to make. So this is kind of a no brainer, but I think that's really the importance of when we're talking about generative AI, when we're talking about embracing that throughout an organization and experimenting with different use cases. And then when we think about it as it relates to supply chain, cybersecurity, all of that sort of thing. I mean, it really is like, it, it, it's not the path in any way to not embrace this and dive in because on the other side of this equation, people are using it to find and exploit vulnerabilities. And we don't want that. And I didn't mention, and we're getting better at transparency or at least the how to do transparency when it comes to software products. Still got a ways to go on SaaS and cloud platforms, yeah. but AI, it's a whole new world. So 
the new AI bill of materials work that's been done and the transparency and how, you know, how are the data models? You have to be pretty much an AI expert to understand how it works from a transparency standpoint to see if it's, if that's a good way to do it or not. Yeah. So I think that we have a long way to go to understanding. Like if you ask, how does Copilot work? Well, you know, it's not just as simple as, oh, we build and compile this. You have to understand the entire footprint and architecture and where it goes through. And that's going to take time uh, so that we can know to trust those suppliers because we don't know, you know, where's the bar, where's the gray area yet. And that's going to be hard. Well, and I think to, to, you know, one thing that is important, and we're seeing a lot of this in our research, that rise of customer interest in AI as a service, because you, know, you just spoke to this level of knowledge and expertise that not every person, not every C CISO has, not every CIO has, you know what I'm saying? Like the, this is a new skill set, a relatively new skill set. And so I think it's really important to understand that there's nothing wrong with working with a, a, a partner, a trusted vendor partner to help, you know, sort of lay this groundwork and get all of the things that you need to worry about, compliance, yeah. governance, all that sort of thing, because nobody who is an expert in this space is saying to you, you should know it all. Yeah. yeah. You know, absolutely. Perhaps. So uh, let's talk quickly about supply chain attacks. So they generally speaking leverage, you know, a loophole that allows a criminal mm -hmm. to avert, avert security controls, uh, take advantage of third-party vendors that lack a good security footprint. How can AI help supply chain ma uh, supply chain managers better monitor and enforce sort of vendor security protocols and and help better mitigate the risks? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that they're going to have a better job of understanding the baseline. We just do not have the capacity to really be able to do that monitoring. And it sort of mentioned a bit about that earlier. Uh, so let's just say we, we take a couple different instances. Um, so for example, there are tools out there that can alert you to say, you know, this came out. So let's just pretend, pretend that a large a uh, customer relationship management tool that we, we won't say the actual name. Let's say they have a vulnerability in their, in their SaaS application. And all of a sudden there was a news alert and it was late. But so somebody normally has to go, are we on that platform? Mm -hmm. Are we to do this? You know, is this in this data center? Is this apply to all? There's a lot of intelligence. So imagine <laughs> not too far from now, that we will have that, you know, the asset inventory is connected to all of this vulnerability management and the OSINT and everything else saying, we are fairly positive. You need to get out of bed at 2 a.m. in the morning and yeah. figure out how to, you know, do this reset tokens. Because it's not only about end users going in, think about all the API keys and right. every, all the tokens that are going in the back end and the integrations and all the things. Most people don't realize. Mm -hmm. That there's, I mean, when we did that ERP uh, update, it had lots and lots of integrations that we had to test. And which ones of those are outbound and externally, you know, facing integrations? So I think AI is going to speed up that intelligence by bringing everything together to yeah. be able to do more of the pinpoint. And the more that some of us, you know, in the industry, we've been working on this thing called, in addition to the software bill of materials, but the VEX, the vulnerability exploitability exchange, is that um, for those products, not, not as much SaaS ones, but if you've got a printer sitting next to you that you didn't realize had a web print capability and so on and so forth, and all of a sudden it was affected and could you, they could you do lateral movement into your network? I mean, there's all sorts of different ways that they could get in. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, your asset management tool said, oh, by the way, you know, these seven printers have this old, you know, have not been patched, pull them off the network. Or I'm just going to disconnect them from the network because they are not listed as a, as a critical product in your thing i mean all of that kind of thing is coming up to us from an ai so it doesn't take 
you know, some person to try to connect the dots, the data is there and they're assessing it and you can put in safeguards, but then there's a level that you can just say, okay, we're revoking all these passwords because it's a non-critical application and we'll deal with the fallout afterwards yeah. um, so that we can respond as quickly as happening. And that's going to help everybody. You know, there's a lot of cloud first startups, but yet they all have these, you know, they're not on SSOs usually, single sign-ons, things like that. Um, so there's ways to see what people are accessing. But, I mean, you can also get around that. Yeah. Just like a developer, you're never going to know. So this kind of intelligence is going, it's going to be able to help us when things like Sense or other ones come about. And, you know, you're worried, am I affected? Do I have this? You know, do I use SolarWinds? I mean, how around the world everybody is going... You know, is that us? Is that us? Same thing with a movement. Um, <laughs> right. And that's where we're going to see that improvement. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah, that is good. I promise you this is not a trick question, but what makes a supply chain resilient? Yeah, resilient um, is a difficult word. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, it's almost, do you want to take it from the impervious, you know, uh, that it can't do it or just resilient um, as in, being able to pick up and, you know, get off their feet uh, for that. Uh, so I think that from a supply chain standpoint, uh, a lot of those and, you know, the industry, when you think about, are we going to have a path forward to be able to recover and move forward without significant um, pain is, uh, that resilience. So it's hard to, you know, I've looked up this definition. What am I going to do? In fact, I remember when I, you know, I guess about seven years ago, somebody used the word resilience. I'm like, you know, in what's, what's the exact definitions? I've never come up with a, with a perfect definition because everybody's going to interpret it different. You yeah. know, this is blue, this is teal, this is that. So for me, what I feel supply chain resilience is that you can, move to standard operating procedure within the time that you've uh, dedicated to it. Um, so in, in some cases, you know, this uh, back to your normal operating mode. Now yeah. resilience means that, you know, your supplier itself may not have that resilience built in at all. And that supplier, you know, we've, I've seen it over the years, even when hard drives, because there was a, um, you know, there was, there's lots of natural events we've had to list, you know, sort of go through for, for a long time in regards to resilience. So, um, what I think for a supply chain resilience, you've got to look at it from that supplier viewpoint, but also the process viewpoint and, um, supply chain resilience is something that over time we will. We just need to work toward continuous improvement. I'm a six sigma ballot belt, so I'm always looking for, you know, <laughs> how do I get better at that resilience number? Yeah. But there's no real number to go with. You're really judging the maturity. And then the next day you can get shot. You know, you're just, yeah. you know, oops, you know, and I've seen a dramatic improvement after COVID. I mean, when the whole world stops and you realize yeah. I can do this, I can't do that. A yeah. lot of companies have implemented, you know, dual paths for creating products because of supply chain resiliency, uh, you know, both from the supplier level, but even their own teams, you know, and, and so there's a lot of conversations. So I think that um, uh, it's, it's going to take time and we will never have a, a true resilient supply chain because there's always going to be links that, that drop yeah. down. I mean, just even the a strike of, of, uh, logistics workers, right. You know, whether it be FedEx or UPS or something like that, th what are you going to do? You know, what's your alternate methods? You would only use them for significant things. So again, when I'm looking at those 54,000 suppliers, uh, you know, there's going to be things that happen all the time. It's what's the impact. Um, but you know, I know it, it is a trick question. You're not going to be resilient um and you really have to know how you're going to respond to when somebody else is not resilient in addition to your own you know procedures but i like yeah, the answer it, i mean it, to look at it as an operational problem like 
you know, as almost like a disaster recovery problem. That that's a that's a great way to look at it. Thanks. Yeah. And you know what, you point out something and, and we talk about resilience all the time, um, cyber resilience, all of that sort of thing. But the reality of it is there is no one answer across the board for every company. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everybody defines what makes us resilient differently. And uh, so, so that's something I haven't thought of before. You know, you mentioned the pandemic one of the things that you know a lot of my expertise over the years has been in all things digital transformation and i was working with clients as a strategist before the term digital transformation was coined and i was helping them begin their digital transformation journeys and and um but you know the global pandemic as as crummy as it was in many ways or as surreal as some of the things that we navigated then seems now um it forced us to embrace transformation in a way yes. that not every company was ready for. And so it really, I mean, I, I always look at that as a bright spot because it showed us kind of where we were falling down, where we weren't resilient in our business operations in a number of ways, and then what we needed to do to move quickly to be able to serve our customers and serve our employees and deal with a distributed work with a distributed workforce and all that sort of thing. So I always look at that as a big silver lining in that whole yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. journey we navigated. So as we wrap the show, um, you know, so I have spent a career as a strategist. So I realize that, you know, there's no one size fits all guidelines for supply chain security, but I, you know, and, and so I would personally say that success on this front has to start with having a strategy mapped out in some way mm -hmm. or another, but what is your best advice to our viewing or listening audience? You know, I'm, I'm listening to this conversation, Cassie, I'm totally buying into everything that you're saying, where do I get started? What do you yeah. think? And that's why I, I started out my book with really defining what it is, but showing here's all the places in different governments, why are they finding it important? But then I go through the different frameworks because honestly, there wasn't a good single framework and yeah. I've participated in, you know, some of these frameworks and building it, but there wasn't, hopefully in the future, there will be more of a solid place, I guess, um, from there, because one thing about supply chain security is uh, just as an example at Schneider Electric, there's 13 initiatives now, uh, you know, 14 plus or whatever that make part of supply chain security. And that's going to be different than a cloud vendor, you know, cloud only vendor because we have cloud products. And so it's going to be very different because, you know, somebody is focusing, you know, on the cloud product is very interested, you know, what do I need to do to be able to get FedRAMP and things like that? And so that's one of the reasons why in the book, I really talk about here's what's out there in the world and then here's something for you to make your own but to set your strategy you really need to understand uh your own business and this is what you know i i see cso's adapting uh especially from uh it's not an only cybersecurity topic yeah and we're seeing this at the business levels now uh in this is happening more and more where companies may have somebody focused on it, especially if they don't do physical products, but you know, they've got somebody that's really looking at what is our overall business. Let's elevate this up to be a larger conversation uh, because a lot of the practices that we um, in cybersecurity are doing are the same as if I mentioned, you know, you have a tornado just, you know, you know, and what's going to happen you know, if your entire customer center was, you know, destroyed. So I think that overall, you need to start from the top and really talk about how are we going to address this strategy as a company, but then lay out that strategy. Are we having, you know, are we part of critical infrastructure? Then having that trust and transparency and that uptime and everything else like that, is paramount and safety, you know, or something of that level. And so we need to make sure our strategy is aligned to that. And up till now, cybersecurity, I, I haven't seen, and I know a lot of CISOs, I haven't seen as much of them in the strategy and business strategy conversations. Yeah. Yet I go and I'm talking directly with, you know, 
places like the Department of Defense and our prime contractors and around the world with our customers every day because as supply chain security, am I not only working with suppliers, but this is very important to our customers. You know, yeah. where, what are we doing to secure this pieces? And so, you know, people in those roles that, you know, as we grow, they need to understand that business and not these are the features is how can I make your your environment, you know, you're my install base. What do I need to do as a company whole? And that strategy, that's really, what do we need to do? I mean, I had you know, incorporated in a policy requiring software bill of materials. It's, you know, developers have been providing that and we have that, but yet it's part of our, you know, strategy. Like now we have this transparency that a lot of other companies don't have and it's making a difference. Because yeah. from a security standpoint, I, I know, you know, I want this visibility from my suppliers, so I should be providing it to my customers. And so I think that we need to take off our technical hats a bit and say, if I was in, you know, the customer shoe and the st strategy, how can I build that? And that means I'm talking with product officers. I'm working with the CEOs of our countries. And, you know, that's something that most cybersecurity people don't get a chance to do every day. Yeah. But those conversations, I mean, how would they know other than just it being a bullet that says cybersecurity on a slide? How do they really know? So, you know, when I, I spoke to our CEO, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I said, this is going to help our customers, but also give us the visibility of what our customers are doing because they want that interaction and dialogue. Yeah. And so that's, that's what builds the strategy. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And you make such a great point just about, about CISOs, CIOs, really being a part of conversations, executive level conversations, conversations with CEO, conversations with the board. This is a, this is a board level seat that, that our IT leaders need to have um, because this yeah. is tremendously important to business. So I think that my advice to people in those roles is, you know, move beyond the lobbying for budget dollars and yeah. lobby to make sure you get a seat at that table because it really is business mission critical, I think, for your company and for your customers. And that's what we're all, you know, this is the bar we're all trying to move, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Cassie Crossley, VP of Supply Chain Security, Cybersecurity and Product Security Office at Schneider Electric. You, as I expected, have been a wonderful guest. We thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. And to our viewers and listeners, Cassie's book, Software Supply Chain Security, is amazing. I will include a link to where you can find that in our show notes. But Cassie, again, thank you so much for taking time to join Joe and me today. It has been a terrific conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, and we'll have you back again. All right. And that's a wrap to our listening and viewing audience. Thanks so much, as always, for spending time with us here today. And we'll see you again next time.